do that because the esteemed, the legendary Hob Bryan is on. Good morning, Senator. Mr. Chairman, how are you doing, sir? It's good to see you. Haven't been it's here in a while. good to see you, sir. Yeah, uh, we both got green back. sweaters on here. I That's was, pretty good. I was going to say I wore this just for you. I was trying to <laughs> take, follow your lead. I always do that. I was thinking about you, and I thought five or ten years ago, maybe even sooner than that, we'd never thought that this could happen, is that Hob Bryan would be the chairman of a critical uh, committee in the Mississippi Senate under Republican control. That was number one. Number two, that they would be talking about medical marijuana and passed. And number three, that he'd be sitting in the big chair with the mute button on Gallo. All three of those things. Well, first of all, I, I didn't know about the uh, mute button. <laughs> I have asked Perez how yes. I could turn you <laughs> off. I'm sure that he could turn you off. And I actually offered him a $20 bill to do yeah. that. Yeah, I know that. I know that. And I thought I told him to take 40 and let's split it. Well, he said he said it would take more than 20, but but you know, that was my limit. Uh, Paul, I was chair of public health, the same chairmanship I have now when mm -hmm. Phil Brandt was governor, lieutenant governor. Well, that's true. That, that, I, I didn't think about that. That that is absolutely true with a lot of experience in here. I, I, I want to start, first of all, I, I want to talk to you about the medical marijuana, but I also want to talk to you about the CON because it was another major story this week. And again, it's past the first phase. You being in, uh, the chair of public health, I, I know you want to speak to that. Your thoughts, first of all, as far as the medical marijuana bill? Well, I, th I think that the process has taken longer than we hoped, and I, I wish we could have done this several months ago. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, I think we have a bill, and every single member of the legislature, if he or she could, would make some changes to the bill. But overwhelmingly, uh, the legislature, I think, has come to a consensus of a bill that's workable. Uh, the two people that have worked so much on this are Senator Blackwell and Representative Yancey, and mm -hmm. I think all of us appreciate the hours and hours and hours they've put into it. And so I, I'm glad that we're able to get this done early in the session. Okay, so the status of that, uh, Mr. Chairman, is this. The changes were made, some changes were made, some of them may be uh, applicable or accepted, and some of them probably not. I'm not sure. I'll ask your opinion on that as Chairman uh, but the bill will come back to you guys because they've amended it. Three of the changes are these, and, and let's take them one by one because I want to see if there's going to be a fight or what you think as chairman of that committee. Well, Number I, one, I, the answer is I don't know, but go ahead. The maximum amount of medical marijuana a person can receive each month goes from 3.5 ounces in the Senate bill. In the House bill, it was am uh, amended to cut a half ounce, uh, so it's three ounces. Your take on that? I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? What, are you, what will you be telling your committee members? I won't be telling my committee, committee members anything. The bill has to come out of your committee, does it not? The, the bill will go directly to the Senate floor. Oh, it goes directly on the Senate floor? The, the motions to concur go directly to the Senate calendar. But the point I'm trying to make is this. The House passed a bill that has some minor changes in it. Mm -hmm. uh, all, all I know is that yesterday they passed a bill the first thing I want to do is talk to Senator Blackwell and see what his position is um, and listen to other members of the Senate and well, I, see if well, we can concur. I understand that, but now we have you on. You're on uh, this incredible family across <clears throat> across the state, and we wanted to pick your brain and see what you thought uh, the acceptance of this would be or would it not be accepted. Do you think a cut of a half ounce is, uh, by the time it probably goes back to conference, is going to be a stopping point or a problem? I don't know that the bill is going to go back to conference, and I do not know whether it will be a stopping point or not. <clears throat> well, the only way that they could do this is on the Senate floor. They would accept these three changes, right? That's right. We could either concur or invite conference. Right. So you think there is a poss I'm, I'm digging this stuff out of you here, but do you think they could uh, possibly concur with this and those three changes would be acceptable? Yes. Hmm. You would think the change uh, taking the Mississippi Department of Agriculture out of it altogether is acceptable? I don't know. I would like to talk to Senator Blackwell about it and talk to other people. This is an amendment that passed, uh, I think, less than 24 hours ago. But as, you're, as a chairman, an individual, and the person who represents um, 
uh, their constituents. What's your thought on that? Paul, I, I'm sorry. I don't, I don't know why you're going off on this, and I don't know any other way to say it. I really would like to talk to some people, in particular Senator Blackwell, who has been uh, working on this for months. Mm -hmm. I'd like to talk to the State Department of Health and see what the other people's perspective is and before making up my own mind whether uh, we should concur or, or uh, invite conference. I'd sure the, like, I would like to concur if there's not some overwhelming uh, all right. complaint. The other part of that was cultivators and processors can now be located in areas where there's commercial zoning. Explain exactly what went on there. These are House amendments. I've not read carefully all the amendments. My understanding is there is an ongoing uh, concern about exactly where both retail outlets are located and where the, produce, uh, the uh, producers or whatever the term is are, are located and it interfaces with city zoning, and there are different views on that. I'd like to hear what Senator Blackwell has to say. I think it's a relatively small and a relatively technical change, but it may be something that means a great deal to somebody. Does it, it sounds to me like uh, in some of the areas where they have uh, industrial parks or things such as that and other businesses, they, they would like to locate there, but apparently uh, uh, there was something in the Senate bill that prevented them to do that. Okay. 14 days came from Barnett, Boyd, C. Brown, Calvert, J. Ford, Hobgood Wilkes, Latner, McLean, Morgan, Owen, Scott, Smith, Williamson, and Wright. And again, the bill now heads back to the Senate. Uh, and if you wanted to hear what it sounded like, it was this. All right, gentlemen, use the floor. The question now recurs on Senate Bill 2095. Open the machine, Madam Clerk. If you favor the bill, vote aye. If you're opposed, vote nay. Has everyone voted? Has everyone voted? I vote 104 yeas and 14 nays. The bill passes. Mr. Chairman, what, what's the timeline on this one? When, when could you guys take that up? Could it be taken up as early as today? Well, I think mechanically the bill is still in the House, unless I'm confused, because uh, until the House adjourns today, mm -hmm. uh, anyone can enter a motion to reconsider. If a motion to reconsider is entered and it's tabled today, or if a motion to reconsider is not entered, then the bill would be released to the Senate. But in the usual course of events, and I assume that's what we're going to do today, yeah. the Senate will have adjourned for today before the House convenes. So we don't have the bill yet. The bill is still in the House. We can act on it when we get it. And I'm, I'm assuming that the earliest we would get it uh, would be after we adjourn today. Then the, the bill becomes law immediately upon, upon passage. It goes to the governor, and the governor has to sign it. How long does the governor have to sign that? I, I believe it's about uh, a week. I think it may be five working days or something, he, but, he but, a, he but could, about a week you know. after, after the bill is actually delivered to him. Certainly with the vote count in the House and Senate, it's, uh, it's veto-proof, so the only other thing that he could do besides signing is not sign it, and if he doesn't sign it and lets it go, it still becomes law, right? That's correct, but the governor can veto the bill if he wishes to. Well, I'm saying that, but I mean log logistically looking at it, uh, with a vote count in the House and Senate, it would be not be wise to try to veto it. Would you agree? Well, I'm not giving uh, policy or political advice <laughs> to the governor. He seems to have done right well on his own without taking uh -huh. advice from me. And uh, I don't know why he would take start to start taking advice from me now. But, uh, you know, the votes sometimes change on an override vote. It looks to me like there's a very large amount of support in the legislature for the bill. I would think so in both the House and Senate. More questions uh, that I could dig up for the Honorable Hob Bryan. Back with Chairman of um, Public Health and uh, Welfare Committee, Hob Bryan. Uh, I had one more cut from yesterday's House uh, debate on the floor. Question in regards to legislative participation in the bill. This bill, I assume, will take effect one July as other bills? This bill is effective upon passage. Upon passage. So by the time all the licensings, we're going to be right at the end of the year anyway. That's correct. We're exempting legislators from participating until the end of the year. So I don't know that we're limiting legislators from participating all that much in the reality of it. I have no plans to get into the industry. Uh, and I don't, you know, I think most of us don't. 
Well, there, I don't know about most of them, but I know some. And I, I, we heard uh, Senator or uh, Representative Yancey say more than one time that he was not planning on getting into the industry. Um, are, are you going to partake in, in the industry one way or the other, Senator Hobb? At the present time, I have no intention of partaking of the industry or of the medicine. Speak to the speak to that timeline a little bit, because I think a lot of people think it's a little bit of a slap in the face when you start looking at this. If it's important enough to put a moratorium on the people who are voting on this, not to profit from this, because it's unlike anything else we've ever done, then why do it to the end of this year when the business is not, the, the industry is not going to even kick up until next year, to be honest with you, or to the very, very last part of this year? You can certainly do your planning, and by January of next year, you can you you can be in it and vote for anything that comes up as far as tweaking this thing. Could you speak to that? It would suit me to have a perpetual ban on legislators participating. Anybody put that in? Did you fight for it in the Senate? Uh, I did. I did not offer amendments to the bill. As chairman, you didn't offer any amendments to the bill itself. Let's talk about CON, the Certificate of Need, and. Let me say congratulations to uh, our friends at the Mississippi Justice Institute and its uh, director, Aaron Rice, who did an incredible job, and also to the client, uh, Bruce Lauder. It is a major, major first-round victory in their challenge uh, to challenge the laws limiting the the access to health care. How do you see this as for, and this this con law has been with us some 80-something, about 40 years, is it not? Well, first of all, the decision was a technical decision. I don't think it's particularly a big deal one way or another. What it means is their lawyer was at least competent enough to draft a, uh, uh, a pleading that didn't get thrown out on the first time it was read. So all it means is they have a chance to prove their allegations. I doubt they can prove them, particularly if they're uh, relying on those folks from George Mason to prove some of their points. I think they will melt under cross-examination mighty quick. So you think the con laws will continue and and be upheld? If I had to guess, I would say yes. That's certainly the overwhelming Tell me why we we need those, because in Judge Reeves, and I read the uh, I read the opinion uh, and he was probably forceful on here saying it was outdated, and if, if did anything, it decreased the competition uh, at a time we need it more than ever. But tell me why you think this is a good idea. I think this is an important thing, an important point to make about the decision. At this stage in the pleadings, with this motion, what the court does is assume that every single thing that the, is in the pleadings is true. So what Judge Reeves opinion does is it just accepts as true all of these allegations and makes the ruling if you can prove this you have a chance of winning so the judge has not come to any decision yet he's just re- repeating what are in the pleadings but this is this is the situation we have with health care in this country and this is the basis of a lot of problems if you have a broken leg compound fracture Mm -hmm. and you have no money, and you have no ability to pay, and you show up at a hospital emergency room, someone is going to fix that broken bone. We're not going to say you just can't afford treatment. You have to sit out there and suffer. And so throughout our health care system, there are people who have no method of paying for money, in some cases, under some circumstances, are provided care. If those individuals uh, randomly show up at providers, then every provider, every hospital, if you want to talk about hospitals, has to uh, bear the burden, uh, the financial burden, of, of caring for those who cannot pay. But there's also baked into the system enough compensation for other, other, from other sources that if you've got a, a, a good mix, that you'll be okay. The difficulty comes about when you have individuals come in to cherry pick, and you'll have, a, for example, a for-profit hospital uh, show up to compete with the other hospitals. The for-profit hospital can arrange not to see anyone who can't pay. There are a number of methods of doing that, dealing with whether you do or don't have an emergency room, what type of emergency room you have, what doctors have admitting privileges, on and on and on. So you can 
fairly well, only treat patients not only who have money to pay, but generally speaking, have payment sources that are more lucrative than others. And so as you draw more and more people out of the system over mm-hmm. into a uh, hospital that is not uh, tending to the uninsured and underinsured, then it's sort of a, a, a difficult financial spiral. That's All right, well, hang of, on. That's sort so, of what happened you, to Grady Hospital in Atlanta. Grady Hospital in Atlanta was a fine hospital. Yeah. But by the time the hospitals in the suburbs drained all the paying patients out, Grady Hospital financially uh, had great difficulty. It was a good hospital. And the certificate of need law, among other things, is to try to avoid the cherry picking that comes about. I was told early on this, because we've had these conversations for decades uh, here, that one lawmaker said it's as simple as this. Um, many years ago in the state of Mississippi, a very rural state, there were a lot of city and county hospitals. They were owned by the taxpayers, and the taxpayers funded them. And then when competition came in, it would dilute that, certainly if they weren't getting good service at the county hospital. And if uh, the private sector came in, they may put them out of business. And that was why the law was there and why it's been there for 40 years. As you phrase it, the private sector, to use your term, that puts hospitals out of business has the ability to do that by treating only the people who have right. money and, generally speaking, fairly uh, lucrative in the overall scheme of things, uh, sources of payment. And so the reason the private sector can outcompete the hospitals that you were describing, among other things, I, I, is I, the I, private I, sector is to treat Forgive me, Mr. Chairman, but I don't understand this. So you're telling me that we have instances like this to the point it affects the financial bottom line because it happens so many times in the state of Mississippi. A child, a 10-year-old child, is, is terribly wounded in a car accident. They go to the first hospital they're taken to. And they're sitting there in the emergency room, and they're bleeding, and they're they're on life support. And that hospital checks the financials and everything else and says, we can't treat you because you don't have any insurance. No, I'm not telling you that, Paul. Well, that's what it sounded like you were telling me. Well, you misunderstood. I'll I'll let you. You you said that they would not treat them at a a profit uh, profit hospital. What I said was the for-profit hospitals have a number of things they can do to avoid being in that situation. Such the, as? If, not, if, if the scenario I, that I Paul, gave you... Paul, if I could get a word in edgewise, I I'm, would tell you such as. All right, go give, give it to me. Such as not having an emergency room that is equipped to deal with those sorts of emergencies. And if your emergency room can't handle the situation you just described, then that individual must go to an emergency room which can handle the case. In all due respect, sir, the, the emergency, the EMT or the paramedic or whatever would not would not take them to a hospital with no emergency room, but will march on. That's this... Paul, that's my point, is you give an example of, of someone that shows up at a, at a hospital like I'm positing and says they're going to treat them. And now okay. you've come around to right. say they wouldn't go there in the first place. Paul, that's Listen. my point. That's one of the many ways a hospital, <laughs> right. if its goal is not to treat right. patients who can't pay, can avoid doing that. Hold and, on. Paul, it's not, because, it's not because the private sector is more efficient and all of that stuff. It's because they're not bearing their burden of taking care of people they're cherry picking okay, just, hold on. just like the big we utility segment just like the big can... utility companies cherry pick and that's why folks out in rural areas Perez, don't have internet check his, bl- check his blood pressure we'll be back for one more segment i'll ask him what is uh, bi- uh, some bills that he wants to push through that he has authored coming up in the next Mississippi, uh, Hob Brian, Chairman Brian. Here's the uh, here's what I was looking for. Mississippi furniture manufacturer is embarking on a nearly six point six million dollar expansion. Kevin Charles Fine upholstery in uh, New Albany plans to add seventy five more jobs over the next four years. Uh, the company assembles sofas, love seats, and more, uh, and it um, it is expanding in New Albany, Mississippi. Always like to give the good news. A lot of that happens every single day, and it's not spotlighted, but uh, it does matter uh, as uh, as we look into ahead. The, we were talking about this yesterday and the day well, or the day before about some of those uh, phone calls with the governor that comes in every single day, and uh, the economy is uh, is is piping out there. So that's good news. 
did want to ask you this. Any bills that you've authored that you would like to spotlight in this last segment? Well, it's not so much bills that I've authored, but uh, Mm -hmm. one of the other things that's moving quickly is the teacher pay raise. The House House has passed a bill with an average pay raise, I think, about $4,500 over several years. And uh, my understanding is the Senate Education Committee today is going to take up the Senate version of a teacher pay raise. I think the dollar amounts in the Senate bill are a little bit higher. And uh, the dollar amounts in the Senate or the House are higher? My understanding is the Senate proposal is marginally higher, but not not by a huge amount. And Mm -hmm. the the method of allocating the uh, pay raise among teachers with experience and advanced degrees, and there's some variations there. But the good news is that um, both houses or both chambers are moving on a a pay raise, which has an average pay raise of excess of four thousand dollars. So that's that's good news. Um, I, I would say that just as I have a great deal of confidence in uh, Senator Blackwell, who has worked long and hard on um, the marijuana bill, I have a great deal of confidence in Senator Dennis DeBar, who's the chair of education. Mm-hmm. He's held uh, hearings about the state, uh, listening to teachers. And, uh, one, one point that he made at one point was, quite poignant. He, he said one of the uh, teachers came to a, a meeting that I think was in the evening, and um, she had to leave the meeting early because she had to go to her second job. She was a school teacher and had a second job to try to make ends meet. So we're losing teachers, and we this is, this is very much needed, and I'm glad that's moving early in the session. Have you given up on uh, anything called a Medicaid uh, expansion, or is it still alive under some other name? Uh, We had an election. We had a candidate who supported Medicaid expansion, and we had candidates in the House who supported Medicaid expansion. The governor of the state made it very clear he's proud of the fact that he opposes Medicaid expansion, and if there's anyone more proud of that, it's the Speaker of the House is re-elected speaker, I think, without opposition. So elections have consequences, and I don't think we're going to have Medicaid expansion. I had uh, one of the greatest policy yeah. failures since I've been in the legislature, but that's where we are. I had uh, the uh, attorney general on uh, day before yesterday, Lynn Fitch, and she mentioned that there is a bill out there, equal pay bill for women. Uh, and uh, she did uh, get back with me in that Senate bill. I was going to tell people what it was. If you want to follow this, the Senate bill is 2451, and apparently we are the last state to pass a bill like this as far as equal pay for women. Senate bill 2451, and we will be watching that. You know, the strange thing about this is I did ask her, uh, were there any violations, any flagrant violations, lawsuits, or anything else? And uh, in the state of Mississippi where that bill is needed, and the answer was no, that anybody could point to, that there was not a lot of violations of that. But just the fact that when people are talking about it, we're the last state to pass that bill uh, doesn't do us uh, well as far as the public image is concerned. Anything that you want to talk about as far as the liquor and uh, uh, wine bill that's moving through? Because there are apparently going to be some changes on that one. No, but I do want to say something about the most serious uh, threat to the future of the state that I've seen since I've been here, Mm -hmm. which is the proposal to either abolish the income tax or abolish the income tax and raise the sales tax to something like 10 percent. It would be devastating for the state if it passed. The notion that people are going to move to Mississippi because we don't have a state income tax is laughable on its face. It's absurd. We have highways that are falling apart because they're not being maintained. Ten seconds. We've talked about teacher pay. It's the same thing with state employees. Five seconds. Water and sewer problems across Three the seconds. state. That's what we need to st- spend seconds. this money on. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Spoken like a good Democrat.